Hi guys, it's Adam and welcome to another video. So in today's video, I wanted to talk about the Schumanist approach as kind of relating to the Jungian approach in, in certain ways. Um, obviously, the humanistic, uh, humanistic approach, Maslow, Rogers, sort of 40s, 50s, 60s, that sort of era, really for me synthesized a lot of that feeling value in Jungian psychology and also kind of synthesized the psychology that was had very kind of Zen underpinnings. Now I don't know the extent to which Rogers was aware of Zen or influenced by Zen. Obviously he will have known about it, obviously he will have looked into it to some degree um, because he was a very well-read person um, and he was very informed on a lot of areas of psychology and philosophy. Um, but nonetheless, the extent to which, let's say, he was influenced by that, that, that would be uh, something that I would need to research further and something that might still be up to, up for debate even after that because of course he's no longer with us we don't know what was particularly in his mind fully um we can never know that even people like for example Jung or um uh, anyone any particular figure in the past that you could mention Einstein or anyone like that uh, even if it wasn't particularly an intellectual um we don't know what was in their mind we know what they write down and then to what degree that is reliable or valid, again, that brings us to, to um, other points because there's always a, a subtle level of paranoia within me um, that always makes me think, well, were they keeping any secrets back that they didn't publish, you know? And, and that comes from kind of um, being involved with spirituality or being involved with esoteric knowledge or practices uh, esoteric subjects like for example alchemy religion even mythology to an extent as well um, and you always kind of feel as if potentially some people could kind of keep some little nuggets back just out of kind of hubris or out of um, wanting to to not have that knowledge out there to keep it like supremely esoteric in the sense that it's only those who find it out experientially who can actually kind of access it um and uh, and that's where you, you know you kind of can draw from that or you uh start to go down this road from that of where we start to get this validity and reliability in the the words of those people you have to give a kind of human level basic trust uh, that what people have wrote down is in fact um, very rigorously kind of uh, critiqued uh, within their own mind because of how intellectual they are, um, is valid, is not too distorted from their own schemas, uh, not too prejudiced towards one particular thing or another. Um, not influenced by uh, massively by personal complexes or um, personal ideologies, all, all that sort of stuff. Again, that comes into schemas and stuff like that. Uh, we need to account for things like cognitive dissonance and um, whether what people are saying is aligned with their action and things like that. And, uh, you know, if things aren't aligned with their action, their, their thoughts or their, their we, well, thoughts we could never understand anyway, but particularly, let's say, their words aren't aligned with their action, um, then that could be cause for concern in terms of the reliability and, and validity of, of what they are writing. Of course, I'm, I'm kind of... Um, giving you a very, very thinking view there, a very, very logical view that isn't really sympathetic to feeling values. But nonetheless, we we could explore all this. But that's a little bit of a sidetrack from what I was talking about. So what, as I say, this, this uh, humanistic perspective did sort of just after or, or even during the latter part of the, the Jungian era, let's say, that first generation Jungian era, um, it really gave um, a sense of 
letting go of control, of acceptance of the person. Now, I will also touch upon some of the drawbacks of this humanistic view and, and the client-centered approach, um, because that is, or the person-centered approach, as it was later called, um, because that is kind of, um, uh, there, there are some issues there, and specifically with me favoring a Jungian view or favoring in general, a depth psychology view. Uh, one of the issues, of course, is is the the lack of um, a direct relation to the unconscious. Now, there is actually a relation to the unconscious in a humanistic view. It is slightly less direct, and um, it isn't as, let's say, overwhelming in consciousness as, let's say overcoming complexes or something like that would be from a Jungian or Freudian perspective. Um, but nonetheless, it is there, and nonetheless, there can be an indirect relationship with the unconscious that allows for an integrative process to formulate um, within that individual, and that does make people aware uh, with some consciousness of various complexes, albeit it does it in a very different manner, in a de very different way. But what we see is we see that uh, Rogers took on board this, this real idea of the beginner's mind in Zen. So we all know about the beginner's mind, or many of us will know about that, uh, not having prejudice and, and essentially being a blank slate for whatever comes up in experience, we greet it with a sense of childlike curiosity. That's a very, very good way to describe the beginner's mind in Zen. Um, and, and a kind of acceptance as well. Um, and so he took on board this idea, uh, it seems at least to me, and within his kind of practice, now bear in mind Rogers was a very scientific psychologist in the sense of uh, with regards to APA and all that sort of stuff and, and, and doing um, things more, more rigorously. You'd, you would say that kind of Jung was more of a traditional empiricist um, and, and less so rigorously scientific in one regard, more airing on that side of kind of practical psychology or almost subjective psychology or subjective viewing of the world, let's say, um, and, and also more philosophy and things like that, um, whereas Ro Rogers was very much grounded in sort of scientific frameworks and things like that and, and of course, did interviews and did recordings, audio recordings, and then analysed them and all, all that sort of stuff. And, of course, there was a lot of qualitative, qualitative stuff with Rogers, um, but nonetheless, it was more of that kind of scientific side. Um, there is uh, comments from a couple of people that kind of said that towards the end of his life, he became a little bit less con concerned with, um, you know, the very, very analytical, very, very dogmatically thinking side of, of uh, scientific psychology and more, or research psychology, and more um, open to the ideas of certain facts outside of that. Um, particularly like spiritual facts or the idea that there could be some sort of uh, spiritual realm uh, or, or thing like that. Uh, now, particularly, it's not really my view to say there is a spiritual realm, and, and it kind of comes into Jung as well, that, because Jung wouldn't explicitly say there is a spiritual realm. He'd say something more like, um, well, we can't prove that one way or the other. However, there are these psychological facts here to say that potentially there might be something like that. Um, but he would never say that outright, and he would never say outright, uh, particularly that um, I can say there is a God. He would say again, as he did say in one of his letters, um, that essentially he can know God by the fact of autonomous things coming up through his psyche with regards to affect or emotions or as, as they're linked to instincts as well or, or obviously the imagistic formulation of that being the archetypes. And he would say that... Um, there is something that could be named God, basically, um, as a factor of the unconscious and autonomous overtaking of my ego momentarily by those emotions or by those instincts. He wouldn't say necessarily um, 
that that is God holy, but it would say that you could name that force something like God. And um, of course, those emanations from the psyche of what uh, of what have brought about kind of things like mythology, like certain aspects in religion, and also things like collective complexes and stuff like that. When there is a, a disintegration with with the instinct on a on a more wider level, um, or particularly a more um, or an archetype as well. Um, but nonetheless, Rogers was quite you know, scientific, quite APA, all that sort of stuff. And uh, when I first got to university myself, I was I, I was kind of taken aback by all that stuff. It was a bit too scientific for me. Now I'm slowly getting more respect for it and more uh, integration with it, let's say, on a, on a psychological level, literally internally within me. Uh, I've felt over, over the last year that uh, while there was some resistance to that early on, and this is the, the young quote, you know, how much of this quote is paraphrased, I'm not actually sure of, but... Basically, the quote goes, what you resist persists. And that's very true. At least in my experience, I found it to be true. Now, uh, when I was resisting that APA and that kind of very dogmatic scientific formulation and formatting and all the rest of it and wording, all that sort of stuff, no anthropomorphisms, no this, no that, making sure that these things are that way, making sure certain things are italicized, all this sort of stuff that goes along with it. Um, and we could get into the superfluous nature of that. Some of it is actually very, very valid. And some of it, even though, um, you know, you have a tendency maybe, or certain people have a tendency, like even myself, to say, well, a bit of it's superfluous. The general flow and the readability of a document, specifically like a, a research article or journal or anything like that, is really greatly enhanced by the, the use of APA formatting and it does really clean it up quite a lot. Um, but particularly, you know, with this idea what persists, uh, what you persist, with it, uh, what you resist persists, um, then of course if you don't integrate that stuff, that you, you almost can, the shadow can almost project itself um, quite easily onto these things that are, that, that are inanimate, you know, inanimate subjects or objects and things like that shadow projection as many know obviously it isn't just shadow projection on a person it can be it can be a shadow projection on anything uh and so you know there can be those elements in there and if you persist persist that that object uh, and that kind of almost unconscious or, or semi-conscious negative emotion that you've invested into the object um then then that will persist in the world um, because from fact of your resistance to it and it, it'll almost feel quite numinous to you because it'll almost feel as if everywhere you go you see that thing or that thing pops up and uh, that as I've said as I've mentioned many times before that is a function of the self um, uh, in terms of things in the world that you're resisting popping up and trying to integrate themselves as an external object into your consciousness so that then you can overcome those complexes and those things within you um, uh, and that's uh, a um, sort of a, a structure or function of the self that is, that is macrocosmic it's way beyond our our comprehension as a, as a full reality um, but nonetheless, these things happen. Um, that's why, you know, you uh, let's say you've got someone who's got hypochondria um, and they don't want anything to do with doctors. It's not that they want to go to the doctors or anything. It's that they don't want anything to do with it. They want, don't want uh, anything to do with anything medical, anything. They don't want to talk about it. Suddenly, when we go around the friends or the family's house or whatever, or, or when we're walking down the street, they always see things and we always hear people talking about medical stuff because the self is trying to make them aware of it, say, you've got to look at this, mate. You can't turn your eyes away. You've got to look at it. You've got to integrate with it. That's what that is. Um, and sometimes it happens and occurs with such frequency 
that you almost can't deny that it's a function of the self because there is this kind of tendency by any rational human and it is very very valid as a criticism um, because obviously you get into all sorts of confirmation bias and things like that when we're talking about these things um, and you know your subjective perspective comes into it and you're more liable to think that something's going on um, but when it happens with such frequency it's actually hard to deny that it, that it isn't a function of the self you know uh, or that it is a function of the self and um, so uh, it, it really sometimes it astounds you with which these things happen uh, and uh, and I mean synchronicity I suppose does come into this to, to quite a large degree um, I'm trying to make the connections in my mind momentarily now to whether it would be categorized as synchronous or causal probably in this relation in this idea it would probably be more synchronous and causal although we all know that synchronicity lies within causality um, because even if you've got a an event that with two causal chains that arise uh, simultaneously and that are linked by meaning those, those two causal chains no matter how far apart from each other in terms of their their micro um, leading up to of causality, the, the micro causal chains that have led up to them, uh, they are ultimately linked by causality because everything is linked by causality. So therefore, that's how synchronicity is causality, or how synchronicity is implicit within causality. And that's why when Jung drew up the, the little diagram, the four diagram there, you know, the synchronicity, causality, and then time and space, or indestructible energy and something else, whatever it was, uh, the the causality and the synchronicity are on one continuum because they are kind of the same um they're the same one unit essentially um and, and that that's quite interesting but i i can't explain any more than that because i've not I, i've i've struggled massively with synchronicity I've, I've spent whoa god hours upon hours upon hours thinking about it trying to look at it in experience really really finely and I just can't do it, not to uh, the degree that I want to, not to the real full degree. Of course, every day I have, well, practically every day, I have multiple synchronous experiences. And also because Jung talks about, as I mentioned before, this kind of um, attitude of uh, synchronicity is always present for those who have eyes to see. That's a function of the self. So the self is always present here and so anything external uh, must be synchro synchronously related to you um, in every every single moment in every single aspect that's why if let's say you are uh, watching a tv program and uh, suddenly you get this feeling that hang on some of the things that they're saying it's almost as if that the people on that tv program are talking directly to the psychological situation within my life right now that's a function of the self and that is actually synchronicity working like all the time um and that's a that's a very very interesting thing and you the, the deeper you experientially go into and intellectually go into synchronicity the more and more it opens up in terms of waves of consciousness and you literally walk down the street and suddenly you have tons and tons of synchronous experiences like all the time throughout your days and there's been days where it's literally been almost non-stop for me it's every other minute it's every few minutes there's a synchronous event synchronous event synchronous event synchronous event tied to what is happening right then in my life now it can be tied to a psychological situation that is that is more relating to a um, a theme that has been going on for a while an archetypal theme or whatever within your within your life or you know a, a, a theme based on a complex which of course is tied to an archetype anyway um or uh, it can be something right there in the moment, like you'll be thinking about something and you'll be listening to a song. Um, a great example, yesterday, um, I was I, I was in a supermarket and I went to the uh, counter and I was buying a sandwich and I put the sandwich through and I was going to pay cash. Now, I never pay cash because, as you know, we're all on cards now. We all just whack, whack our cards. But I had some, got some money out the other week and I thought, you know what, I'll pay cash because I need to use this money, right? So I go and pay cash. When I'm getting the cash out and put exactly what I'm putting in the machine, I've got my, earphone, my AirPods in and I'm listening to Juice World. I really like Juice World. Great rapper. 
um, the level of spirit on that guy is incredible. I mean, I could do a psychological interpretation of Juice World, by the way, because I, I've looked into it with quite, quite some intensity with regards to the, the really severe negative affect coming from his animo and, and leading him to the drugs and everything. It, it's quite incredible, Juice World, actually. And there's real synchronicities in his music as well. And in the way that the people of uh, you know, the, the designers of the videos and things have put them together. It's actually quite expressive of um, the, the journey to wholeness as well, but that was never attained by Juice World, and that, that's very, very sad. Uh, there was one particular lyric in um, Feel Like like a God, which is a Juice World song, that said, uh, Juice King Tut, and of course that is an Im as soon as he's wrote that lyric, he's got an image of uh, Tutankhamun in his mind. Of course, Tutankhamun died young, uh, and that's obviously an archetypal kind of projection um, uh, that basically is within Juice World's consciousness as well, because he was very, very, in a lot of his songs, he talks about dying young and how he doesn't think he's going to make it and all that. And in a sense, that's an archetypal theme that um, is basically, you know, inviting that and and that's almost predicting that in a in a certain manner. Um, and that's why, you know. Um, you know, put it in that lyric. It was very, very interesting. That's an emanation from the unconscious as well. Um, but nonetheless, so that was just little things like that. But anyway, I was putting the cash in the machine. As soon as I did that, on the song it said, cash, 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 like that. Because, that, you know, that's a part of the song. And I just, you know, you just have to giggle at those things. It's like Marie Louise von Franz says, the primitive man always comes up when we have a synchronous experience. He always comes up and you want to kind of laugh about it. Um, or, uh, you know, it, it's very easy to get that kind of smile. And, um, you know, so I do that. I just I just laugh because it's quite funny. And, and it's clearly linked by subjective meaning right there and then. Um, of course, there is a causal relationship, though. Like I talked about, co synchronicity is within causality because... You know, obviously, the same causality within my one life, within my one body and my, my own actions, has has put the video on at that specific time, or, or that's led up to that, that specific time, as well as the outer environment. For example, the YouTube pe playlist being ordered in a specific fashion is the outer environment leading up to that song being played at that exact moment at that time. Um, but also, it was my own causality that pulled that money out at that, at that exact time. And and that, those outer events of causality are still within causality. Of course, they're not in my particular causal chain in terms of my body and my action and my mind, but it's in the external environment. And so it's still linked to me causally, and it's still linked to via causality. So that entire experience there wasn't synchronous, it was causal, you see, but you could say that there is a synchronous element embedded within causality. Um, and, and how much you're going to believe that is dependent on um, how much you want to believe that in a sense, because as I say, there is uh, a level of confirma confirmation bias that comes into this. I am infected by my own schema on the world and my own knowledge on the world and my own ideology. I um, I have read a, a lot about Jung. I've read a lot about psychology, a lot about alchemy and things like this. Uh, and a lot about religion and spirituality. So I'm biased to that. And whenever a synchronous experience happens, I get reinforced positively uh, in my neurophysiology in terms of that positive affect coming up and of course in behaviorism as I say that's positive reinforcer and then suddenly the next time I, I associate that and associate that until it's just almost as if everything's synchronous almost because my my physiology my body is wanting to get that positive affect that that positive emotion in my mind and it's almost like my my body or my my um my being is um wanting to reinforce itself to get to that positive affect um, um, and so that's quite that's quite interesting actually to look at it from that perspective as well um, and of course you know confirmation bias and stuff that, that's around that that surrounds that um, and so many other things that, that we can't even be aware of and all the rest of it so um, so that's clearly in there but getting back to the humanist conception, because I've, I've diverted there and gone on a Jungian tangent that was no doubt very necessary. Um, but nonetheless, um, this this humanistic idea, I really uh, enjoy it. Now, I have been having therapy for 
uh, I'd say seven months now with a person-centered counselor. Now, of course, that means that I have the advantage of the experience of that form of therapy as an individual. And I, I am one for every psychologist um, having various different levels of therapy for um, various different things, you know, in terms of various different, um, uh, with regards to Freudian psychotherapy, Jungian psychotherapy, the humanistic approach. I've always, um, or, or for probably a little bit of a while now, I've wanted a classical Freudian analysis because it just because I'm curious as a psychologist, I'm curious as a psychology student, and um, I think that everyone should have that. I think that we, you know, as psychologists, you should all have, you should all try out like a buffet these uh, different varieties of psychotherapy. For one, because obviously you need that if you're going to be a practicing depth psychologist or anything, and that is a requirement um, within you know the training of psychoanalysis, and specifically being a Jungian analyst, of course. Um, obviously, I've done three years of, of self psychoanalysis, and that gets you quite far. Let me tell you, it gets you bloody pretty far, but doesn't get you all the way, you know, because complex is always unconscious, and so you always need someone to bounce off. Uh, a mirror, you know, as, as like a kind of mirror or as uh, ju just someone there to pick up on things, the, the elements of unconsciousness still remaining within you. Um, but for some, somehow or another, I think this is a, uh, a testament to the power of dreams, actually, because my utilisation of dreams has been um, very, very um, large, very copious. I've, I've dreamt a lot and, and used them a lot. Um, but I've managed to get over a lot of the things that were unconscious within me. Uh, and so, again, I think that's a testament to the dreams. And I think that, that um, it also goes to a, a firm Jungian ideas and things like that from at least my experiential perspective. I'm not saying affirm them in a, you know, in a collective manner or anything, but for me personally, it's affirmed them um, and, and allowed me to see various different things. And uh, and, it, and it just goes to, to show that, you know, you can do certain things without an analyst, but nonetheless, as I say, I'm a big believer in having these, these different um, analyses yourself. Um, uh, because it really gives you a, an understanding of the theory from a practical perspective. So as I says, as I say, person-centered counseling, seven months now, um, and uh, I understand from that, from an experiential point of view, not really as much from an intellectual point of view, although I've done a bit of reading on, on Maslow and, and um uh, Rogers, I all, I've also covered it in my semester this year, uh, over the last couple of months, um, not to any big degree, couple of hours, two, three, four hours, that's about it, um, but nonetheless, I've got a little bit of a basis on it intellectually as well, but uh, with regards to this, uh, you know, humanistic psychology, as I talked about, and we'll get back to maybe the more feeling side because I was uh, I've been very very rigorously thinking at the moment. So it draws out of Jungian psychology the feeling values, and it allows an integrative process with the individual, with the uh, analysand um, or the client in this case, I suppose you would say, um, that allows things to come up from their psyche without too much interruption from the counsellor. Now, of, of course, what have we been talking about recently? We've been talking about Wu Wei. And what does this come into? Of course, it comes into Wu Wei. See, there's this tendency within a counsellor or a psychoanalyst or a clinician to see something within the person and then say or want to kind of just hint at, maybe not say outright, because of course it's sometimes good to keep some stuff back if the person's not able to integrate everything, you know, at that particular time. But there's always this desire to hint at certain things. Um, and when I say hint at, I don't mean hint at as the humanist would. I mean hint at in a, a way that's kind of quite... Um, forthright let's say or, or quite um, kind of you know state something um, and so that's not always the best or the effect the most effective method can be 
but it's not always the best best method because we all know the the one thing about psychology you know no one's going to change unless they want to change all of that sort of stuff and that's one of those kind of true things about psychology if we're being honest um because i've talked to people about certain things within themselves and what happens is that uh, if they're not ready, they, they will just look away. They will just ignore. I mean, they will literally either physically look away or what will happen sometimes is their eyes will glaze over. So that's another one. So you're talking to someone and you're hitting upon something within them. Um, and then suddenly, you know, they, they look away. They're not really listening. They're fiddling with things or or what will happen is, as I say, that their eyes will glaze over and it's kind of like they've gone inside themselves, they've regressed a little bit, like momentarily somehow. Um, because, of course, you're touching upon something there and uh, they're just going to walk away if it's not their time. They're not going to want to kind of involve themselves in anything, uh, in any sort of chat. Where, and, and this happens in friendships, relationships or in counselling. Because in friendships and relationships, don't forget, you are practicing a dialogue. And within that dialogue, and within the certain think conversations you have, you will be touching upon their complexes, and they will be touching upon yours. And so you'll be able to see these things even just in friendship dialogue. Um, and um, that is, that there, there can be an argument made for friendship, and proper friendship, and true friendship, being... Um, not a substitute for for therapy. I wouldn't go that far, and I, I've I've never said that before. Whenever I've talked about this, I've never gone quite that far. But it, it gives a kind of form of therapy in a way. Um, obviously, there's more that needs to be done in a clinical setting for for most people, uh, especially if they've got certain disorders or you know an abundance of complexes and stuff like that and they've got physiological responses from that you know with regards to the psychobiological nature of the complex things like sweaty palms heart racing all those kind of things numbness of the body or you know just general random pains here and there might even get ibs or things like that as well with it um, with intense forms of anxiety or you know a full range of things um lightheaded uh, itching queasiness or you know if you've got all this sort of stuff going on on a regular basis from something like um generalized anxiety disorder panic disorder something like that then um obviously that friend you know it needs there needs to be more done uh, and whether that's done by a union of medication and uh some sort of, some form of psychotherapy or whether that's just done through psychotherapy i wouldn't argue on the case of just done through medication because you're not really getting anywhere there you need either the union of psychotherapy and medication or just the psychotherapy to be able to do something um and, and even as i've said self psychotherapy can work but you have to be incredibly committed to your your development and it only works for those people who are incredibly committed if they're not committed they're just gonna hide away again all the rest of it now what happens with a committed individual in that setting is that they have setbacks and then they they go push forward again have setbacks push forward again a lot of negativity of course but then end up getting somewhere so of course there are aspects to that in um you know with regards to to friendship therapy and stuff like that now in the humanistic view um with regards to in this kind of client relationship um they allow as i say this stuff to come forth from the psyche and that has the advantage of aligning with the ancient practices with regards to uh, zen Taoism, things like that. It actually aligns with that, which is what we want to do because we know that meditation, mindfulness, Buddhist practices, these do have strong, valid uh, effects, positive effects uh, to our psychologies. So naturally, we want to incorporate them in. And, and that was done in the humanistic view even as early as the 40s, 50s. So that, that's great. And of course, that was done also within uh, Jungian psychology, you know, 1910s, 1920s, that sort of era, and a little bit later. Um, and so that's good as well, because the, these things have a valid 
valid interpretation. The one good thing about psychology, and there's, there's a lot of negative things about psychology at the moment, uh, with regards to certain aspects of psychology being superficial and not really deep enough and not really getting to the source of things. Um, but one positive aspect of psychology at the moment is that we do, even from a scientific research perspective, um, incorporate these ancient traditions that were primitive forms of psychology, the Buddha's uh, kind of discipline with regards to gaining spiritual awakening or enlightenment. That was a discipline founded on certain psychological facts that actually are still true today and that actually can alleviate people from suffering and things like that. Um, and again, with all the Zen stuff. And, and, and we do have that within research psychology, particularly, uh, and especially at Bangor as well, where I am, particularly with mindfulness and stuff like that. Uh, there's, of course, there's a move away from the kind of religious connections or, or religious ties to mindfulness or to, to things like that, which is arguably either a good thing or a bad thing, depending on what your take on religion is or depending on what you feel um, is positive within that conception that, that ties to religion. For example, what is it within mindfulness that, that and religion that actually tie to each other and that mean that the two together can be more of, effect, uh, of an effective tool rather than just mindfulness as cut off and dissected from religion. But again, that's a, a whole other debate in itself. Um, but nonetheless, we have this come up and we have, as I've said, this beginner's mind by the counsellor. That's what the counsellor is trying to attain, uh, a beginner's mind in Zen, no prejudice. You could even uh, link this to another humanistic conception uh, in the hierarchy of needs and things like that of self-actualization um, in the self sense of a lack of prejudice uh, and spontaneity particularly. And that can even come into the uh, therapeutic relationship between the, the humanistic counsellor and the client um, and, and that would be very positive actually because that would encourage creativity and encourage something something to come out um, of the individual and even to develop the counsellor themselves as well because Jung was very specific on this as well that, um, that the, the um, psychoanalyst can actually use the and, and I mean from a modern, modern ethical point of view um there's there might be some considerations here but from a uh Jungian standpoint this is absolutely incredible and uh for me personally I don't have any ethical qualms about it. I don't have you know being a Jungian you don't generally have as many ethics anymore with regards to your shadow and with shadow dreams and all that sort of stuff and most of you know we all know health and safety has gone mad and we all know that, that even in psychology, ethics and ethics approval has, has gone a little bit too far for me, personally. Um, and some of the studies in the 60s and 70s, which are now deemed unethical, for me, aren't, weren't unethical. And, and it's just a case of we're just being a bit too much of a, what is it, a, a nanny state? Is that is that the right word? I don't know. But of course I'm going to think like that, um, because I, I, that's just how I am. I'm like that. But nonetheless... Um, uh, what was I talking about? Oh, yeah, so the, um, uh, yeah, so Jung talked about this kind of, uh, you can actually develop with the analysand and use their development to kind of impact yours in a way and, and use what they're saying to, to impact your development in a, in a specific way. You can actually, to give you kind of a, a, an example, you can actually use this, you don't even need this in a, in a, um, client um an analyst relationship you can actually have this just with friendships and relationships so for example you can see when people are starting i've talked about this before so imagine you have three people who are saying to you oh you really ought to do this or you know what you're a little bit too like this or a little bit too like that well obviously in a Jungian perspective that's the self communicating to you um, that actually this is something you might want to look at consciously and integrate more uh, with that or exclude more of that from your personality because that's actually a negative thing that's relating to a complex um, and so if if people say for example like you could say well uh, someone might say oh you're just terribly 
analytical, you're far too thinking, you're, you're not at all um, emotional or anything like that, you, you know, I never see you express emotion, and let's see, m say multiple people say this to you over, uh, you know, a time span of let's say a couple of months or whatever, then clearly you can use their words as development for your own uh, for your own psychological development. Now that's slightly different to what Jung's talking about with regards to the you know within the therapeutic relationship, and there's a lot more depth there and a lot more uh, relating to complexes and archetypes and all this sort of stuff. But from you know a basic kind of example there, even just in friendships, that's kind of um, what's going on. So uh, this all happens, you know, within the humanistic view, let's say, um, we, we have this kind of beginner's mind going on, we have this Wu Wei going on, allowing these things to come up. And, and what this allows to do, getting into a bit more of the meat of it, I suppose, is it allows the individual to kind of almost f have a therapy session with themselves in a sense, and, and Rogers talks about this in his book, I mean, it's client-centered psychology, I was looking over there, because I did previously have it over there, uh, client-centered uh, therapy, um, and he, he talks about this, you know, you want to get to a point where the person feels like the, the analyst is a mirror, is uh, is kind of there, they're talking to themselves, essentially, um, and and they're they're able to express things and, and understand things and gain realizations about their psychology on their own. Now, why would we want someone to gain realizations about their psychology on their own? Well, it cements it more. Imagine if I tell you something about yourself, then you might say, "Oh yeah, I, I yeah, I kind of I, I kind of can see that in me. Yeah, all right, I, I get that." But you're liable not to fully believe it. And until you've had an experience of that working within you, or you have an experience of coming to terms with it yourself. We all do this every day. Someone tells us something, an opinion, an idea, whatever, and we might think, well, yeah, well, yeah I can see how that's true, definitely. But you don't really fully take it on board. But when you have an experience of it, or when you get to that logical conclusion or that emotional conclusion yourself, it clicks and you're there. So of course we want that person to, to get to that themselves. And so doing this and kind of um, letting go and kind of um, allowing that, just literally being that kind of uh, voice there that talks back and just very, very subtly hints at things without that kind of dogmatic, um, you know, hinting that let's say uh, any other school of, of psychoanalysis or, or, or therapy, well let's say, therapy or counselling would do, um, because it's not really strictly psychoanalysis for humanistic view, but nonetheless, it, it, you know, there's, uh, it is a, a school of therapy, it's a school of counselling, and um, so, you know, in other schools of that, uh, it could be more, well, there's that complex working in you, there's that thing working in you, there's the other working in you, and it's more like that, you see. Um, there's kind of a means, let's say, or there's a there's a preconceived notion there in the therapist's mind that then can disrupt um, from this kind of healthy flow. And uh, when that flow is attained in the humanistic view, of course, what that allows is for the individual over a number of months to be able to not only start to realise things and feel as if they're the ones to attain uh, some some psychological strength for themselves. They don't feel that the therapist has attained that for them. They feel that they've attained that in themselves. I've got over the certain things inside of me that were that, that you know I previously thought were deficient or whatever. I've done that, um, and I know where I stand in relation to that. And and so that gives a, a certain power um, and a certain kind of resilience and a certain kind of a uh, newfound relationship with the the solidarity of their own personality. Now, from a young view, of course, um, the, there's a lot of animus stuff that comes into this, and, and hero archetype stuff as well, and being able to be more solid within yourself and things like that, uh, and, and taking uh, those kind of projections off the external world, especially like things like father projections and stuff like that that could possibly present be present. The humanistic view allows this to happen um, 
Uh, obviously, we don't go into the depth of it, but these integrations are kind of happening in different ways. Um, I, I don't know, I, I don't want to comment on too much to the level of efficiency that that's happening because I kind of, something within me kind of doubts it a little bit still and kind of makes me, it kind of makes me feel that the Jungian view or another view, um, kind of because it goes directly into the unconscious, integrates more effectively um, because you could never really know because the humanistic view, because it does it on a more sort of conscious level but not conscious level, now that's hard to explain, but it, it, it kind of talks about certain things in therapy that may be relating to complexes, but it doesn't explore the unconscious by dream analysis or anything like that, or really going into it. So it does it on a conscious plane, but also it's not conscious of certain facts that other schools of psychology would be conscious of because of going into the unconscious. And so, you know, there's a little bit of, of disconnect there for me because I feel as if possibly um, it's not quite as efficient. However, uh, the personal experiences I've had with it and also, the, as I say, the reading I've done on it um, would suggest that actually it is quite efficient with regards to um, gaining a better sense of self and gaining more creativity and definitely definitely gaining more spontaneity. Uh, now, of course, I have the confounding variable in my own um, analysis, shall we say, um, of the fact that I'm doing Jungian self-psychoanalysis -psycho self alongside uh, having a humanistic counsellor. So, of course, I've got a huge confounding variable there that means that I, I, I can't distinguish which is, is the better thing. Now, what I do know is that I've been doing Jungian self-psychoanalysis for four years and I've been having this therapy, humanistic therapy, for seven months. So I can distinguish between those timescales, you see, and before this seven months, I can distinguish how the integrative process was working within me just solely within the Jungian sense. Now I can distinguish it with regards to the Jungian sense and the humanistic sense at the same time. Now, what a good sort of self-psychological experiment, which I do them on myself all the time, of course, any good psychology, sh well, any good psychology student should, um, when you're, let's say, a pra practicing clinician, uh, it might be better, and this is only an opinion, not to do as many psychological experiments on yourself, just so that then you're a little bit better for your clients, you know, you're a little bit sound. Because as we all know, looking into the unconscious or any other form of psychological experiment, uh, looking at certain things that are arising within you, your thoughts, your language, etc., how that's expressed for you, uh, can cause a lot of turmoil uh, within the psyche. So, of course, there's, there's doubts there or there's things to mention there. Um, but what would be a good thing is, of course, to do a humanistic, a solely humanistic um, time period of a few months without any Jungian stuff so that then I could get a real view of it. Um, but I can certainly see how even just from the humanist side, and this is a very, very subjective perspective here, but from the humanistic side, I feel as if that has given me a little bit more of that spontaneity because before the humanistic um, side of things came in for me a few, uh, few months back, um, I was spontaneous, but I was still clinging to things a little bit in terms of more rigid um, styles of life, let's say. Whereas when the humanistic uh, side came in and I was having these therapy sessions regularly, as I am doing now, I kind of saw a level of spontaneity that was very, very interesting and very, very aligned to this natural form of, of, of self-actualization. Um, now, of course, it's a lot different for me because I'm a psychology student and I'm fairly well, well read on, on various different bits of psychology, including neurophysiology, including various different forms of therapy, uh, various different schools of uh, psychoanalysis, and also modern conceptions of various different forms of psychology. And so, of course, for me, it's um, uh, any form of self-actualization is a little bit weird to say because um you know someone who let's say is self-actualized as 
an artist or this or that or, or something else in that kind of realm uh, hasn't kind of experienced that psychological theory um, and so me having experienced this psychological theory I have kind of a, a different dimension or a new dimension opened up within that as well which I have an incredible level of gratitude and privilege to to know that I see that and to know that that's there as an experience within me I mean it's it's the levels of beauty to be able to see the psyche and to, to be able to see the certain things working within you from a psychological context um, even just within any aspect of your life that's incredibly incredibly beautiful and it's something that really is um, uh, you, you should have gratitude for that it's, it is an incredible thing um, but nonetheless that only does come through a lot of work a lot of suffering intellect all the rest of it and my god i'm just starting you know i'm uh, 25 jesus i'm at the start of my journey basically right now and so no doubt there'll be a lot more intellectual pursuit and uh, suffering as well experiential suffering that will allow me to understand these things more deeply and allow me to gain a, a better sense of self and a better uh, it sounds almost kind of weird a better sense of self because I've been working on a better sense of self for three years and I feel like I've come a long way with that um, so to think that a better sense of self even more so it's kind of like it, it feels um, weird it feels funny to say in a sense but nonetheless you know a better sense of self going forward as well um, but yeah so so we do have this tendency in the humanistic view to be able to integrate these things but on this more let's say not superficial level because I don't think that's the right word I really don't but on this different level of, of analysis that's a good way to say it on a different level of analysis and um, uh, and what I really enjoy about the humanistic view is that uh, within the experience of uh, humanistic counselling is this kind of a ability to kind of open up to experience and Rogers talks about this it's one of his key points he has like uh, 20 key points or something uh, they're not called key points by the way they're called something different but one of them is openness to experience and that's not relating to the trait openness to experience it's quite ironic that that trait came around way after Maslow and Maslow kind of got honed that down beforehand but naturally um uh, as someone who was very very aware intellectually and spiritually um maslow uh, sorry not maslow i say i keep saying maslow uh, i mean rogers rogers had the whole uh, openness to experience and all that although because maslow was a humanist he would have integrated that idea and understood it and uh, and gone with it as well like like uh, rogers did but um uh because Rogers was a particularly intellectual uh, intellectual person and also um, uh, you know had that spiritual dimension as well um, there would have been an easy tendency to to view the fact that prejudice is um, kind of a more childish thing psychologically and openness to experience is and an kind of freedom within all of these different varieties of experience positive or negative is more of a spiritual standpoint and Jung knew this as well Jung talks about in various passages kind of uh, ideas about openness to experience he doesn't of course use the the word that's associated with the now big five trait um, but he basically Jung has predicted as I've mentioned before openness to experience as a trait in one of his books way before it happened, 60 years before it happened, 50, 60 years before it happened, uh, which is remarkable in itself as well to consider that. Um, and that's a part of Jung's genius, really, with regards to just one aspect of that, to be able to um, predict things that we know now that he didn't even have the resources to predict scientifically. He didn't have the resources, yet he predicted them. That's how, you know, it's like mind blown. And that's what it, it comes into, as I've talked about, with all this intellectual intuition. And being able to distinguish based on the, the subjective um, vehicle of consciousness what that relates to with regards to trait psychology or with regards to various different things, even like with regards to um, the objective processes of the brain. If you can 
effectively um, dissect what happens in our subjective consciousness. What happens is that you will find a parallel, maybe in years to come, because maybe there's no research being done on it right now, but you will find a parallel with the objective processes of the brain because the two are the same experience. The subjective consciousness is created from the objective brain. So whether you study the objective brain or whether you study the subjective consciousness, it doesn't matter because you're just perceiving the same thing from a different level of experience. And so Jung didn't have the advances in neuroscience that we have now in fact i don't think cognitive neuroscience or anything like that was around um effective neuroscience and things like that it just wasn't around um so uh these kind of things that we've got great advances on um you can see easily certain things with regards to um feeling function and stuff like that so i'll give you a, just a quick example um, the way in which the brain works particularly the limbic system with regards to the amygdala and the hippocampus when we uh, familiarize ourselves with someone, let's say that person, let's say we, we know them quite well, and let's say that person does something, just, just something slightly untoward, nothing crazy, just something slightly, or just says something a little bit slightly untoward. Yes, okay, we might uh, be prone to feel a little bit negatively towards them, but what it's been shown neurophysiologically is that we actually um, can kind of not go as hard on that person. And we all know this from a subjective perspective anyway. It's common knowledge. Uh, let's say a stranger does something or says something that you're not particularly 100% happy with. And let's say your wife says something or does something that you're not particularly happy with. Then, of course, you're going to be more lenient with what your what your wife said, you're like, well, all, all right, okay, maybe you know it's fine, it's all right, I love you, all the rest of it. And but this stranger, you'd be like, well, hang on a minute, I don't, I think that's started, you know, all of that. You're gonna be there, the two differentiations. And what is this denoting in a Jungian perspective? It's denoting the neurophysiology and the the idiosyncratic differentiation of the feeling function as relating to your individual memories in the hippocampus and of course the relations to the amygdala really incredible um, so the feeling function differentiates itself neurophysiologically as well and Jung of course Jung didn't know that because he, he didn't know about well he might have known that because obviously he would have learned about the structure of the brain he knew that it's in um, uh, well there are different aspects in various of, of his books, but uh, even the one I was thinking of, his meetings with Jung, he talked with E.A. Bennett about um, a particular brain structure where there was a research study done uh, where they stimulated it. Uh, it was what I think it was a brain structure in the, in the brain stem, um, and they stimulated it, and the guy actually saw a mandala before his eyes, which is very, very, very interesting. Um, uh, that's and, and Jung was very very interested in that as well but nonetheless he would have known about those brain structures to a lesser degree that, that we know them now of course um, and so he could have like used his intuition to kind of understand how to get to that formulation although what I'm doing now is just reiterating it and giving it a bit more of a uh, cognitive neuroscience kind of background or a neuropsychological -psych background um, to kind of flesh it out a bit more and, and understand it a bit more from a scientific perspective rather than solely uh, an intuitive perspective so that's quite interesting and so we have that kind of formulation um, within Jungian psychology but getting back to the um, openness to experience, and, and this is something very, very interesting within the humanistic view, as I've talked about. So what generally happens when we're going through this process of uh, counselling with, with regards to that humanistic view is that people can open up to this uh, uh, these new variety of experiences. Now, of course, when I naturally i'm genetically high in the trait openness to experience and in fact i'm probably three standard deviations uh, to the right of the mean on a normal standard distribution um i'm probably definitely in the top five percent in the world maybe in the top two percent in the world 
in openness to experience i've done many tests on it and it always come out of like 98 percent or something ridiculous uh, it, it's absolutely ridiculous like the levels of, of that so i was already already high in that specific trait and that can determine how uh, i'm able to interact with new experiences of course and and um, whether i'm going to be amicable to them or whether i'm going to try and shut them off and more likely from a genetic predisposition and of course from a socialized disposition because my mum and dad and my you know my grandparents and my parents always told me to be open to things to be to be uh, to do different things to try different things because of course my dad is very high in openness to experience because it's a genetic component. My granddad is very high in openness to experience on my dad's side. Uh, and so it's differentiated itself um, uh, within the facet of, Im imagine, within a sub facet, there's six sub facets of openness to experience within the facets of imagination and particularly intellectual curiosity. Um, and that has differentiated itself over, generationally over three generations, even more so actually, most likely. Um, and we've got to me now here um, with regards to even higher openness to experience levels than my dad or my granddad, reinforced socially within my family. Uh, and so naturally, um, there is kind of... Um, that tendency within me already to, to do that. Um, uh, so with me, with my particular therapy, I, I was already very you know open to experiences and open to, to closing down prejudices in a certain way. And of course, because of my spiritual um, kind of experiences and also spiritual reading and stuff like that, and intellectual reading, psychology reading, I was open to that quite a lot. But what I also found was that I, because of that spontaneity, and, and this is very true in, in, in a humanistic view, when that spontaneity is accessed more, spontaneity kind of opens the door to creativity or kind of leads on, bridges on to creativity. And so, you know, I found myself being more creative, doing more poetry. I even... Uh, uh, now I'm terrible at painting, I'm terrible at art, I don't want to give anyone the impression that I'm good at that sort of stuff because I am not and I'll happily take that. I uh, I still do it, I, I still enjoy it from time to time, I've got a couple of sketchbooks there and stuff, I just like doing it, something interesting. But I've never really painted, I've not painted since I was about 15 or something um, and even then, you know, it's just the kind of little uh, you know you get a canvas one time and you think oh I'll do a painting and then it never happens again um, but I did a painting you know and I felt that was something creative inside of me that wanted to come up and um, so naturally there's, there's these kind of areas in which uh, creativity is stimulated a little bit more uh, and that kind of gets you to this sense of self-actualization and the that is in, uh, encapsulated within or, or, or kind of encapsulated within that self-actualization is your neurological structure, is the trait, the genetic trait, trait structure that you have, and you're kind of aligning with it in the best way possible. Now, of course, we have something to consider here, because, um, you know, you're not really going to want to align with trait neuroticism, because if you align with trait neuroticism, what that would mean in a kind of uh, a linguistic formulation is that you want to be more neurotic. Well, that's not the case, of course. But what happens is you you lower your neuroticism by uh, impacting this openness to experience and overcoming your fears, all that sort of stuff as well. And implicit in this open, this higher level of openness to experience that is that is gained through uh, counselling or therapy is kind of an openness and willingness to overcome your fears. So that's implicit within that. So then what happens is you get a, a differentiated individual that is, you know, unconsciously individuated at a certain point or consciously individuated or whatever, um, who is individuated for their specific trait structure and discounting or, or pushing down neuroticism to the lowest level it can go. Of course, that is always going to be a genetic component of trait neuroticism. And so, therefore, there will always be a slight bit of neuroticism there. This is what Jordan Peterson mentioned that Carl Jung got wrong. As far as I'm aware, that is true. Um, Jung did get... Jung had this kind of attitude that... You get rid of all the complexes, then you're an integrated individual, and there's there's nothing there. There's there's uh, you're fine, you're great, you're done. Um, 
uh, that doesn't seem to be the case. Now, what you can argue is you can say, well, uh, if Jung is saying that complexes are the form of neuroticism, or the for, you know, neuroticism is formed from these complexes, then you can, if you extinguish all the complexes, the neuroticism go, comes down to a healthy level, and that then you're an integrated individual, and, and you've just got a bit of it, um, uh, and that would work. And yes, okay, there are quotes from Jung, there are uh, interviews from Jung that would say, uh, or even quotes from uh, Alan Watts and people like that when talking about Jung, um, uh, that would indicate that Jung actually did have uh, a level of understanding, and he will have done, to obviously he will have done to some degree, but I just don't think he entertained it as much as possible, or as much as he could have done, um, uh, and and these quotes and these ideas and stuff like that, that I'm talking about, as I say, from Alan Watts and from other people, uh, and, and from Jung's interviews, uh, lend this kind of sympathy to neuroticism, or to anxiety, or anything like that, or any sort of uh, good level of anxiety, like low level of anxiety, um, that kind of make you feel as if there is a, a kind of acceptance that that is present anyway. Now we know from modern psychology and modern studies um, that trait neuroticism is, uh, you know, it, it's more complex than let's say Jung or anyone else maybe g gave it as much credit and i can see why jung wouldn't give it that much credit because what it's not helpful is it it's not helpful from a clinical perspective to say right then uh, there's this particular neuroticism here and we can't get lower than that so what we're going to do ah, well, well we'll just get you to some part of the way and then that's it that's all you can ever hope for you see looking at it from a genetic or an innate perspective can be good from a scientific viewpoint but from a kind of experiential viewpoint but where you want to help someone where you want to help a client it's kind of restrictive and one of my lectures has actually talked about this um, she uh, is a uh, what do you call it applied behavior analyst and um, uh, she talked about because of course you know behaviorism not particularly favoring any uh, so much innate things or innate predispositions but nonetheless she said um, you know uh, that it can be restrictive and I do believe that even though I am on more of the innate side because of being a Jungian naturally um, and I can formulate, and I have formulated many, many arguments, quite simple arguments for the fact that everything comes out of the genome, everything comes out of genetics, uh, rather than, um, you know, everything being socialized or anything like that. The socialization, as I've talked about, um, and I've not really formulated any you know, good, incredible arguments on video, but I have done in my book. Um, uh, but basically, there is a superficial socialization that is a reinforcement and punishment of the instincts, but everything that is around you is has come from the genome, and everything around you is uh, from the instincts, but just socialized. So there is socialization, but it's not as everyone thinks. Everyone thinks in modern psychology that socialization is kind of this separate thing and there's, there's there's kind of like this thing that we control and that we do all but actually what it is is uh the socialization is um a, a kind of system that that is based off the instincts of genetics so all the instincts that i portray in in life all the time um with regards to the animal and animus, like I'm doing now, even just in these words, or uh, like certain other instincts that are coming through me, uh, will reinforce themselves and punish themselves within the individuals, and that goes to create everything, uh, the, 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 the kind of landscape that we see on the planet right now in a very, very macro, very, 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 very complex way. But a lot of people think, um, and I do believe, and I'm going to say something quite harsh now, I think that's a product of a lack of intelligence and a lack of being able to think. Um, and and when you get to a certain level and a superior level of understanding, you can really see this quite easy. It's not it's not at all um, incredibly hard or anything. But you have to think to get there, and you have to do a lot of thinking to get there. Now, okay, I might be a little bit harsh with that, and I might be living in my shadow a little bit with that statement. Because, of course, we have to make the argument, well, 
certain people have a certain scheme or an existence that means that they see things differently and then we also have to make the argument from that well hang on a minute you have a certain scheme on existence that means you think in a certain way so how can you be sure you know in again this Nietzschean perspectivism debate how can you be sure that that is, that is what you're saying and yet you are so bold to claim that hang on a minute yes it is right and it's people who are lacking in thought that, that don't understand it but nonetheless uh, I think that's just a product of my own um, kind of voraciousness of spirit and real looking into things that I kind of don't have sympathy I just don't have sympathy for for um, people who can't see things like that because um, if you do the work you will see it in like see it really piercingly and then you'll be like oh yes I know I see so there is socialization thing, thing called socialization does exist but people tend to think that it's like this separate thing from nature it's not you can't have anything set James Hillman says it actually the archetypal psychologist um, you can't have anything separate from nature we are nature nature has evolved our brains our bodies etc everything that comes out of me everything that I create is nature even this computer right now is a formulation of different things in nature that we've put together to combine into this technology and yes it is metal and yes it doesn't look like nature in the fact that it doesn't look like a tree but it is nature it's a formulation of nature from our own natures which are have within them implicit nature so you see there you go um and so it, you can't have something separate from nature so anyone who says like oh socialization is a man-made thing or it's a it's separate from nature that that's not true it is nature it has to be from nature it has to be from what we have here it has to be from the archetypal arrangements that are within us that literally the archetype of our body the archetype of the fact we we have organs organs are archetypes you see and so um our bodies have uh, an archetypal substance to them or an instinctive substance to them shall we say and um and everything that comes out of us is therefore nature and so it's not that there's socialization here that's separate from nature and that's nurture what it is is that there's nature all the way along it's all nature but yet we can perceive socialization from our own subjective consciousness as if it is a more man-made or ego thing in which we have complete control within that. But actually, that's a fallacy. That's a mistaken belief. It's kind of like you're looking for a, a screen thinking that. But actually, behind all that, what's going on is it's nature at work all the time for you, everything you do, inst the instincts, everything. That's how it is. Um, and, and and you know as i say intelligent you know really um well thought out people you know have really thought about this stuff who've gone into an intellectual passion can see that those who um aren't as intelligent generally say ah well it's all nurture or ah well it's all nature uh, no ah well it's all it's nature plus nurture the nature plus nurture thing it doesn't it doesn't exist there isn't a thing called nature plus nurture in a sense but there is nurture but nurture is nature the the fact of nurture is nature it's all nature so it's like when people say that it's like yeah but it's not nurture it's not you nurturing it it is the instincts within you nurturing themselves right i'll give you a great example to really cement because this will cement it so um uh, right so you have uh, all of these instinctive tendencies uh, within a person and um they push up and let's say you've got uh, you know they push up from the genome and then create that person and flower out now imagine you've got a mother and you've got a child right um now you would say that that it's the mother's will to nurture that child well, first thing is, the mother's will is an archetype, it's the animus, so, so that's within the archetypes, but, or the instincts. But, let's say that you say that mother's will, on her own, nurtures a thing. That's to say that she has an individual will that nurtures that baby, and that's aside from nature, that's socialised. 
Well, it isn't, because the fact of her wanting to nurture that baby comes from the maternal instinct, which is implicit in the, in the genetics, in the genome. It's not her doing it, it's something pushing through her. It's, it's the psychobiological nature of gene expression. I've got the book there. The psychobiological nature of gene expression pushing through the mother, saying, you must do this. It's exactly like, it's kind of like Richard Dawkins' selfish gene, where the, the gene pushes forth to procreate. The gene does this, you know, within you. Genetics do this within you. It's not you, there isn't a you, you're just an individualized um, formulation of genetics based on a genetic lineage um, that has a formulation of an individual body and some sort of formulation of individual kind of personality um, but that is all based on a very very finite um, uh, mix of various different instincts that are working through you at any one time and that therefore the, the components of yourself are all collective and are all uh, collective things that everyone shares but they're just individualized in a specific arrangement but nonetheless none of it's you it's just all instincts and um, then when you start to see that then you can start to see the idea in, in the Buddhist tradition uh, from a scientific viewpoint you can see the idea in the Buddhist tradition of the fact that there is no substance um, that you know like when the Buddhists say there is a tree but it's not a tree why isn't it a tree? Well, show me what's a tree about it. Why is it a tree, the Buddhist will say to you. The enlightened master will say to you, why is that a tree? Well, you know, it's a tree. There you go. It's a tree right there. But then he says, show me the essence of what a tree is. And then so you take the tree apart and suddenly you find bark and you find a leaf and you find all these different cells going right in. But you can't find a tree. You can only find the things that make up the tree, you see. And it's exactly the same as that. You can find the things that make up our, our bodies and our minds, but you can't find the mind specifically. Because your individuality, really, it doesn't exist. It, it, it does exist, but it doesn't exist. It only exists as a formulation of various different components on a collective level. That's how it exists. But, but it doesn't exist in like a, a really full you know rigid way so that's you know that's very interesting when you when you can look at that and when you can formulate these things and understand these things with with some level of intellectual fervor you know so many people and i'm gonna have a bit of a rant now but nonetheless uh it uh, it does it does annoy me and i am probably living in a bit of a complex here i'm touching on probably one of my intellectual complexes or something but a lot of people just do not think. They, they think to the degree that it's necessary. Well, that's wrong. Who, who, what's the point in thinking to the degree it's necessary? You're meant to think to the degree that everything is formulated and you know. You can know. It's like Jung said as well. You know, I, I can't believe a thing. I have to know it. I have to know that there's a certain hypothesis there that is reasonable and that has been tested to be able to know that, well, yeah, I, I, can, I can believe that now. I, I know that, you know. Um, it's not even that I can believe it, but I know it, you know. And so that's the level I get to. I don't just get to this level of necessity or, or, or just necessary. Like, oh, well, yeah, socialization plays a part, this plays a part, or this is probably about how it is. So there we go, I'll leave it there. No, I have to in, 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 until yes. Got it. Then, right, that's there, that's great. I know that now. I've, I'm done with that. And I've philosophized for God knows how many hours on that one thing, but I know that. It's like the um, uh, gender and sexuality thing. I philosophized and and read and, and experienced so much with that, hundreds of hours of, of horrific thought, horrific thought, but now I know that, and although I will still do research into that anyway, just to even further still, uh, with, with regards to intellectual formulations of it, and being able to communicate it in an effective way, um, but nonetheless, um, you know, that's that, down, and I, I feel there we go. But I didn't do that to the level of, 
you know, oh, it's just necessary to get a certain amount of knowledge. I did that to the point of exhaustion to be, I have to know that this is the way it is. Because if you don't know it's the way it is, then how can you know that any of your hypotheses about the world, about psychology, about physiology, about religion, about, you know, God or any of these, or, or spirituality or anything, how do you know that that can be correct? You can't know that that can be correct. Of course, we can never know whether there's a God or not. I can tell you very interesting and in-depth things about why it's very probable there is some sort of uh, patterning system that kind of has a uh, a sort of link to some of the religious ideas of God, and I can tell you that that's, that's correct, but I can't tell you that God exists specifically, and I can't tell you, I'll never be able to tell anyone that God exists forthright, exactly, and that's the great thing, because why would you want to, you know, in that, in that situation specifically? The moment I know God God exists is the moment I may as well bloody just put a knife through my chest. So that's done because, and I say that very specifically, because the nature of myself is is curiosity. The nature of myself is is philosophy as well and philosophical um, questioning. And and imagine if I knew God existed. Well, and 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 I know that after this, there's some. Let's say I know about certain things that are after this, and I'm assured of them. And, and they seem to be pretty okay. I'd be like, right, knife through my chest, done. You ever seen that Doctor Who episode called, um, what is it, the Veritas episode? I forget forget what that, uh, Extremis, that's, that's the name of the episode. Where they're in a world that is a computer-generated simulation, and it's not the real world, but they're actually living in the real world, separate from that. So to get back to the real world where they actually are, they basically have to kill themselves. It's kind of like that, you know, if you knew you were a computer generation right now, and but yet you your real life was somewhere else, and if you killed yourself here, you'd go back to your real life, you, you'd just kill yourself, like, straight away. Like, that's what we did in the episode. Everyone just did that in the episode. So um, you would do that, but nonetheless, so... You know, you wouldn't want to know a question like that. You wouldn't, I don't think, not to the full extent anyway. Um, but nonetheless, I like to know things. I like to have them down. And I, I've done enough research now um, to be quite confident on certain religious and spiritual ideas in their scientific reality uh, rather than them being separate from science. I'm quite confident and assured on that. Um and also with certain things like God God and things like that, I'm pretty assured on. Um, uh, but nonetheless, you know, these sort of things, there's also a feeling dimension to them, you see. You can't ever work them out in a thinking manner. So you get to a point of this place of uh, most things that you can know, you get it down and you hone them into that I know after hundreds of hours of, of thinking. The other things, the bigger questions, you get them down as best you can, and then what happens is you use your feeling and your intuition to kind of have a relationship with the knowledge you've gained in uh, an analytical or philosophical study of that kind of metaphysical question. And then that allows you to kind of bridge the gap, and it allows you to think, well, within the context of my life, what I want to believe, what I'd like to experience, then you can you can be more confident in that and you can be more assured of that internally. Um, now, of course, if you've got a very, very highly rational person, they would be prone to saying, well, that's quite a weak viewpoint. Um, but nonetheless, you know, you can't... The fact, the implicit kind of um, Kantian categorical fact that you can or it's almost Kantian categorical at least, that you can't ever know, uh, you can't ever know these things, actually implies that the intellect isn't enough anyway. So therefore, what are you going to say? You say, right, okay, so the uh, you're going to say to me, try and do more thinking so then you know God or whatever, you know. Or I might say that to myself. I might say that to myself. I say, well, you know, I need to do more thinking to know that God's there. But, 
then you know this comes in this Kantian angle let's say um, and then you start to understand this kind of fallacy of complete intellect of being able to completely get that and then you have to think to yourself you have to go back to what I was saying and you have to think well clearly it has to be just done on the feeling and slight intuition to bridge the gap to give your life a sense of wholeness within the uh, the understanding or the, the reverence of that philosophical or metaphysical question that, that you are questioning or that you are doubting or whatever. And Jung talked about that as well. He said uh, something along the lines of when um, you basically take knowledge to the extent that you can take it and then you choose after that to believe something that is ne necessary to believe because you've taken that thinking uh, to its ultimate level. Now, of course, I am paraphrasing in quite a disjointed way there, um, but that's somewhat of the basis of, of that kind of a lot shorter quote in actuality of Jung's. Um, and it, and it, is, it is very much true. It is very, in my experience, it's been that. Um, and, and that's just what you have to do. So, um, anyway, just kind of rounding up this humanistic view, getting back to that, what I've done in this video... Um, helpful it might be to some people maybe not so helpful to others has come gone back and forth between humanist young, younger Jungian ideas humanistic ideas Jungian ideas humanist, humanistic ideas and stuff like that with other little bits thrown in but that's the way I roll that's kind of just the way my brain works it, maybe it's I, I do I've had this kind of uh, hypothesis for a while but it relates to openness to to portray openness to experience because naturally openness to experience um, characterizes itself in intellectual curiosity and uh, you know imagination and all these different things and being able to see links in different things as well as we've talked about before and so imagine that you've got someone high in trait openness in a philosophical discourse or uh, you know in a conversation then naturally the way their mind works is going to be to hop from thing to thing and they're getting images in the psyche imag imaginative images and stuff like that and uh, and different words and ideas popping up all the time and they're 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 going to be kind of driven down those new things those down the new paths with regards to their micro expression in that conversation of uh, openness to experience and so they're going to go off on tangents more often whereas if you've got someone high in conscientiousness their brain works differently and so they're going to kind of go down that route of um, actually making sure, especially let's say for a sensation type opposed to an intuitive type, an intuitive type naturally is going to be l looking further down the road in a sense and is also going to be kind of like uh, making links and then um, uh, and, and being able to actually resolve things in an intuitive manner and then move on, move on, move on, move on. Whereas a sensor, conscientious sensor, is going to be um, more like methodical get things down get things down get things squared off and then move on to the next thing then move on to the next thing it's like when i'm talking to a couple of friends of mine who, who are high in conscientiousness or and they are sensing types um whenever i'm speaking to someone like that i always get the feeling as if they're very good in terms of right we're looking at this now we're on this thing now then we're on this thing next Whereas me, intuitive, op high openness, like a bloody, you know, a PPSH, you know, one of them guns, whatever, like a thousand rounds a minute or whatever it is, ridiculous, and you're just spraying everything. That's the way my knowledge comes out. And to people high in openness, that'll really work for them. Um, but for people low in openness, that'll be like, what the fuck? But, you know, you know what I mean. It'd be, what the hell just happened? What just happened? So, um, and they might not have picked up on much of it because it's too, it's too sporadic for me. It's too all over. So that's my kind of hypothesis on that. And that hypothesis does have good. It's more of a theory uh, actually than like let's say a. Uh, a hypothesis or anything like that because it is grounded in things we already know in in Jungian psychology and and also in. Um, uh, in, in modern trait psychology as well so, so it's more of a theory than let's say just uh, you know a, a hypothetical um, idea or anything like that it's got a bit more grounding than that to it um, 
but I do feel like that's kind of the way it is really um, unifying the kind of trait psychology with Jungian psychology and there are if you if you're interested very many ways to actually understand the big five traits the neo pi um in uh with regards to jungian concepts as well shadow um animal animus um you know all those kind of things sensation intuition that sort of stuff there, are, there is a lot of that in there as well that that can link in and that's quite an interesting formulation to to consider that that you know the modern trait psychologists have actually echoed what jung said as well it's quite in fact everything in modern psychology bloody echoes what jung says it's ridiculous every time i go to a lecture you know they tell me about new things here and there and uh, I'm just like, oh, well, oh, that relates to the shadow, or that relates to this in Jungian psychology, or that relates to the other. Um, oh, what is that? Discursive devices um, in, um, oh, what's it called? I've forgotten the name of it, but discursive devices within uh, discourse, something discourse anyway. Um, uh, and that is basically where you're kind of, formulating unconsciously or consciously kind of ways to influence the person you're talking to um by using specific language or whatever it may be and that that happens unconsciously and consciously um and that clearly relates to the shadow you know as a structure as a as an instinct uh, or as a collection of instincts there's loads of different disorders that relate to various different um instincts as well or archetypes archetypal forms like um naturally antisocial behavior disorder and things like that relating to the shadow there's things things in there um heuristics heuristics actually um can really relate to uh, the fleshing out of archetypes and archetypal ideas uh, a lot of the stuff in behaviorism i've talked about reinforcement punishment or rule governed behavior all that sort of stuff is is archetypal um there's so much. I mean, it, it, there's an abundance of stuff in 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 psychology. I mean, we just did a, a lecture that was, of course, very very relating to the shadow last week with with regards to the atrocities in Nazi Germany and stuff like that. And you know, so there's all those kind of things that would come into it. And there, there's so many. I mean, I am actually looking at the links as a side project in my own mind because I have about six. I well, I have about. I was going to say 16, but probably not at the moment, but probably about six side projects that go on in my own mind, like intellectual formulations or trying to work things out uh, in, in like ways where I'm, you know, I'm doing my work in the day and all the rest of it, but these will be kind of formulating themselves in my mind as well at the same time. So I'm trying to work on an understanding of uh, schizotypal personality disorder, uh, things like that, schizoid disorder, um, you know, paranoia, paranoia and things like that, what their relationship is with the trickster, with the trickster archetype, because I really, I really believe schizotypal personality disorder has a relation to the trickster archetype, um, and that's very, very interesting, and, and things like that, and there's so many different things, you know, in, in modern psychology that just absolutely relate to, to these Jungian ideas, it, it, it is absolutely remarkable how, and and yet we are not taught them and nobody sees them nobody sees the links um between all these different things and i mean as i've naturally picked up on before the um neurophysiology uh within your uh, jungian psychology that's something that people have worked on for quite a while not well not so much in the jungian sense but in the freudian sense uh, with regards to i think it's like maybe the 80s 80s or 90s um there was a few people working on that still is now but obviously like in that time that was the first kind of um hit of it let's say but there is so much abundance right now for any psychologist coming forward you know even like myself but it's just i've got too much on to even consider this at the moment and i've not got enough knowledge on the brain to do this quite yet either but it might be something for my future um is the neurophysiological um ideas now that we've got uh, within Jungian theory and, and putting Jungian theory into a cognitive neuroscientific um, understanding because if we did that that'd, that'd be leaps and bounds we'd be on leaps and bounds and you see that's the thing that Jungian psychology lacks a little bit of although it can be scientifically proven um, in various different ways I didn't, I didn't used to think it could be but I do now because I've got a bit more understanding of things now 
but although it can be scientifically proven uh, it's not really been done and it's been shoved aside as a bit more mystical a bit more speculative from modern psychology when it completely isn't it's the most advanced form of psychology in my opinion there is um, it's just that the reason it's pushed aside side by so many people is that they, they, they don't understand the nuances of it they just don't understand it on, on a deep level it's not they're not it's not it's too much for them um, or aside from that if it, if it isn't too much for them and they are actually quite intellectual they brush it off as being too spiritual or you know favoring like the opposites and non-dualism a bit too much and all that and they want to go down a more atheistic view which i can sympathize with those guys because at least they have the intelligence to understand it in depth as well you know for example like um sam harris or um zizek the, the philosopher like those people have kind of brushed it off but at the same time i don't know so much about sam harris actually but you know they have bushed it off to a degree um and they've gone down like a more atheistic viewpoint uh which i can see and which i can sympathize with um and it's very very interesting actually um uh, and so you know with those people I, i'm like i'm totally on board with that because they're intellectual enough to understand it but they've just said well you know what uh, it's not really my sort of thing and i'm gonna go away and you know someone else can do it and if they want to argue it then i'll argue back and all the rest of it but that's that um but with a lot of people it just got like if, if we taught jungian psychology in one of our psychology classes like in depth so many people would just be like uh, you know i can't i can't understand it to the day like yeah you say things like shadow anima animus and you explain briefly what those mean to people or persona oh my god we get it straight away it's so easy it's like yeah this is great it's all but to have a real in-depth understanding of them it takes someone incredibly passionate incredibly open to experience incredibly uh, understanding of various different fields philosophy psychology religion spirituality mythology all the uh, anatomy and physiology even though i'm not well up on that at all but I, it's on my to-do list um alchemy as well all these sort of things you need someone very intellectually kind of um, voracious wanting to 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 dig into stuff um and, and only those people would really understand it uh, i would say that probably about 80 to 90 percent of the the psychology cohort that i'm in at the moment which is about 200 odd students just wouldn't understand it to any depth they'd understand the they'd understand the so superficial stuff like oh yeah the animal is the feminine side of a man's unconscious and the animus is the masculine side of a woman's unconscious and shadow is you know your negative stuff and you know they'd understand it in that way but they wouldn't understand like the nuances in experience and how fine it goes down you just wouldn't wouldn't do it um so that's the reason why it's not come in really but um it's uh you know if we had that scientific basis of neuro cognitive neuroscience we're fucking hell so many people would uh god they'd they'd be like oh shit yeah i'm, I'm down with this now we need to study this like more in detail because this is this is this, there's there's levels here you know uh that we've not previously seen but anyway, just to finish, I'll just um, wrap up on the humanist view. So, or the humanistic view. I um, I really like it. I really think it's good. And I know that might be a bit um, left field for me, you know, talking about Jung all the time. And then I say, uh, oh yeah, the humanistic view is really good and all this sort of stuff. But I do, I do believe it's quite good. And yes, okay, as I've mentioned, it doesn't go into the unconscious. That's a drawback of it. It really doesn't go into the unconscious it doesn't really get to tackle directly with these complexes in the unconscious but nonetheless it really does formulate um you know a, a, a stronger sense of self spontaneity creativity the ability to someone just get to grips with themselves a little bit more and i do feel it has a a, a place even in modern psychology uh, or, or modern kind of counseling and therapy uh, and, and that's why it's still utilised today, you know, with people there utilising it. Um, generally, things that die out are those things that, that, that aren't that great anyway, or they, they get kind of absorbed into other fields or unified into other other theories. Um, 
and so that's why it kind of is, is still pleasant um and, and so I do feel it's quite good. Now, obviously, as I say, the drawbacks are the fact that it doesn't go into the unconscious. It doesn't do that dream analysis. You see, if you got a humanist, well, you can't actually have a humanist, uh, humanistic psychologist who does dream interpretation or dream analysis because it goes against their core attitude. Their core attitude is this kind of like beginner's mind. And, and as I've said, and allowing things to come from the psyche of that individual so then them trying to analyze a dream isn't really going along their path but you, you could do it i think you would have to basically say what do you feel the dream means i mean i've actually given a few dreams to to my counselor and and uh and it does there is a kind of dialogue there that can work with dream analysis in a humanistic setting but it's it can be difficult uh, it can be um, challenging because of the fact we can't really, you know, we can't really get that deeper level. Um, we can't really, you know, get these kind of complexes out there in the open with with the directness, let's say, of a Jungian, Freudian, or whatever. Um, and so that is a bit of a drawback. But nonetheless, I feel that it uh, added all of those things that were necessary in the ancient kind of spiritual and religious traditions that were very very psychological at heart so i think that's brilliant as a, you know as a summarizing here um i uh, think it's a very very zen uh, way of counseling or way of therapy um which is brilliant because you know me i like zen i like that sort of thing you know koans and all that stuff. although obviously we don't use koans in in um uh in humanistic therapy could you imagine that you just walk in <laughs> So, what's the sound of one hand clapping to to someone who's coming in with an neurosis? That'd be absolutely ridiculous. But um, no, so they uh, so you know, but there is this backdrop of Zen. There is this backdrop of Zen which I quite like, um, and I really do feel like it's kind of um, a way of getting people to a state of being uh, that is in line with themselves, and and this comes into self-actualization this comes into particularly as a phenomenon in Jungian psychology unconscious individuation not so much conscious individuation although there may be some people who get there probably not through the humanistic way but there might, there might be but more like unconscious individuation it gets people closer to that um, I mean those people who are going to get to conscious individuation will get there anyway um, by just naturally you know the formulation of their psyche the formulation of what uh, what they have to hand you know causality around them over a number of years uh, the things that they're introduced to books and all that sort of stuff um but no i do feel it has that so that's really good and i do feel it gives them uh, gives people the humanistic view a sense of uh, the feeling function that isn't um as prominent in other psychologies you can do it in Jungian psychology, no doubt, especially if, let's say, the um, analyst is a feeling type, then, you know, you can have more of a feeling dimension come forth. Um, but I really do think the humanistic view does that feeling element proud, does it good. Um, and I do think that um, the, uh, what else was I going to say? The, the emphasis on this being and also the love the the general unconditional love it's called being love in in the humanistic view uh which is ben basically a form of love that that has within it a certain type of of again another to use another humanistic conception peak experience not a peak experience that's kind of mystical or anything like that but more of an emotional peak experience that that is an unconditional love for a particular person and that's what we would refer to in Jungian psychology as differentiated feeling as the feeling function differentiated for a specific individual um, and and kind of coming up as a, a real sense of warmth within you a real sense of idiosyncratic um, passion for that other person and it's very unconditional it's very uh, almost paternal or maternal as i've talked about it before in the past and it and it's a lovely sense of being happy in yourself in relation to the environment and also um 
that kind of sense of love that extends to that other person but it's a it's a very holistic and, and unifying experience as well and that comes into humanistic psychology in this conception of being love in the greek conceptions of like the the six or seven dimensions of love um i can't pronounce it by the way but it's called agape or something like that a g a p e you wouldn't know that i have a greek friend would you really you, you wouldn't know that because i can't pronounce these things but nonetheless um that is uh it, it ties in with that because in greek culture that form of love is very highly respected and it's a very unconditional form of love like this being love like you know true differentiated feeling in the Jungian tradition and um, so so all these things come together really and so I really enjoy that about the humanistic view as well that real relationship with that feeling function and the other thing to point out is creativity the fact that it really draws upon creativity and it allows a person, let's say, I mean, the humanistic view is brilliant, or the humanistic form of counselling is brilliant, I feel, for anyone who's creative because it allows for that to come forth spontaneously, naturally, instinctively, and it gives you more of that compared to in the past, let's say, when you've been confined by, by certain attitudes that you have in yourself or or certain complexes or whatever it may be and so that's very very interesting from the humanistic view, point of view so i will leave it there guys we're coming up with an hour and 45 now uh, nearly coming up to two hours and um yeah really a crazy video today a long one um but nonetheless uh that was interesting so i will uh, leave it there and i will see you in the next one so see you very soon guys